If you will, turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Amen. And it's an honor to stand before you tonight to minister the word of the Lord. I uh, give honor to Pastor Shepherd, Sister Shepherd. <clears throat> There's no... Well, you can't compare the leadership that we have in this church with our pastor. Um, and we appreciate him, his ministry, his love, his compassion, and his passion for the Lord and the house of the Lord. Amen. In the kingdom of God. And I, Brother McClary says it often. We say it often. When we stand before you, it's big shoes to fill. So we just feel honored to be here. We don't take it lightly. And I give honor to my beautiful wife. Amen. Look at her. She's just beautiful. I ain't going to teach like this. <laughs> Stay ahead. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20. And then we're going to, verse 20 and 21. Then we'll, from there we'll go to uh, Deuteronomy 7. The word of the Lord says, And when thy sons asketh thee in time to come, say it, what, meaneth, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondsmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor chose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Amen. I know we prayed, but can we just pray one more time? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you help me, Lord, minister your word. Dear God, help me be sensitive, dear Lord, what you want me to minister today. Let it be you as we open our hearts to receive what you have in store. Let everything be done, Lord, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I'm going to read a couple of more uh, verses of Scripture uh, <clears throat> before I give the title of what I'm going to teach today with the help of the Lord. Uh, I just want us to understand that the Lord had brought uh, Israel out of Egypt. And we did it. He did it with a mighty hand. It, it, it was a great event. Amen. We know that Egypt is a type of sin. Right? We come out of Egypt. And the Lord delivered them out of Egypt and took them to the promised land. So uh, he brought them out. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, the Bible says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Salkoth. About 600,000 on foot that were men, besides children. And a mixed multitude, everyone say mixed multitude, went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. I ever have the Message Bible? Anybody have the Message Bible? Read it. This is how Exodus 12, 38 reads in the Message. It says, there was also a crowd of riffraff tagging along, not to mention the large flocks and herds of livestock. All right, Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude, everyone say mixed multitude, that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of, all, of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now those scriptures in the message is written like this. The riffraff among the people had a craving and soon they had the people of Israel whining. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it free. 
to say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic, but nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna, manna. That's the message, Ray Lynn. And uh, I want to talk just for a few minutes on the topic of riffraff. You know, the Israelites weren't the only ones that came out of Egypt when God delivered them. They had riffraff with them. They had a mixed multitude. And uh, many commentators use the word riffraff. Uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, I think we know riffraff defined in a free dictionary is defined as people regarded as disreputable and worthless, especially collectively. Rubbish, trash, that's a th groups of people regarded as the lowest class. Other commentators use the word rabble in place of the word mixed multitude. And a rabble was defined as a disorderly crowd, socially inferior or uncouth. This mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with the Israelites included, there were people that were, that were slaves to the slaves. Uh, they were uh, people that were nobody get offended because it's just how it is. Okay, they were interracial. They were uh, had Egyptian fathers and Israelite or Hebrew mothers. Okay, they weren't full-blooded Hebrews. Um, this included people that just wanted to escape Egypt for whatever reason that were not Hebrews. It was a mixed multitude called, or we're going to call it today, and commentators use the word riffraff or rabble. And I want to make this emphasis at the beginning, like I did in the first two scriptures, that when the Lord delivered them, he delivered them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Amen. It was a great occurrence. It was mighty. But along with the Israelites came the riffraff. And we'll get into this a little bit more, but it was the riffraff that initiated the murmuring. I can jump way ahead of myself, but I'm going to try not to. Because we need to be careful and vigilant. About the riffraff. Oh, I'm going somewhere. These people were not Israelites. They were not happy in Egypt for whatever reason. Yet they were not, they were not part of the promise. So they attached themselves to the Israelites. And then they ended up greatly influencing them. <clears throat> that first expression in Numbers chapter 11 of the unhallowed desire came from the mixed multitude. I think I mentioned it before. They were aliens or half-breeds who had come with them, not from faith in God, but from inferior motives. You see, the riffraff had no stake in the promise. Understand? They, they weren't delivered. They were just part of the deliverance. You understand? They were tag-alongs. They had no faith in God. They were just looking for a way out of Egypt. The murmuring was initiated by the mixed multitude. It was among the mixed multitude. A great crowd of foreigners who had been neighbors to the Israelites in Egypt came forth with them at the Exodus, moved by one motive and some by another. It is instructive to observe that these were the first to break out into the rebellious murmuring. Equally instructive to observe that the evil generated amongst them spread from them into the body of the Israelites. A commentator wrote, the mixed multitude began to lust there and acting according to its nature. What was the nature? Is this that the riffraff had no covenant. They had no promise. Right? That was to the Israelites. They had no assurance of Canaan. They had no promised land. 
They had no. Promised land. They had no lot in the tabernacle. Hence, the mixed multitude was free to think without or hindrance on the so much loved delicacies of Egypt. In other words, the riffraff had no problem saying, We had it better in Egypt. They had no stake in the promise. They were in the here and now. It was like, What can you do for me now? Now, I used you to get out of Egypt. Now, you're bringing me out here. They had no stake in the promise. They had no uh, commitment. They had no faith. It wasn't their God. They were just along for the ride. The fifth wheel is to say. I was thinking about that earlier today. You ever been on a double date and then there's a fifth person? You know who controls that date? The fifth person. Right? Because the couples don't want to fit. Yeah, yeah, no, right? There's a fifth wheel that controls everything. Well, riffraff were the fifth wheel. Nobody really wanted them there, but they brought them along. So now they had to put up with them and they had to cater to them. Riffraff. I think I'm going somewhere. Israel had their challenges. However, the mixed multitude compounded it. They remembered the fish in Egypt. They ate freely. They remembered the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But the promise was not for the mixed multitude. They had nothing to lose. They had nothing to lose by going back to Egypt. They remembered the food. They reminded the Israelites of the food, yet neglected to remind them of the hard taskmasters. Right? The whips, the labor, the straw, Exodus 1.11 says, therefore they did set the, over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Exodus 3.7 says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Exodus 5.10-13 says, and the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers and they spake of the people saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will give you no straw, or I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where ye find it, ye ought not of your work shall be diminished. In other words, I'm not going to give you straw, but your, your commitment to the finished project isn't going to change. Now, Riff Raff reminded the Israelites of the, of the delicacies of Egypt but did not remind them of the torture and the torment that came along with the delicacies. All right, so what's that got to do with us? What's that got to do with this? What does riffraff have to do with us is that we've all been delivered out of Egypt. But all of us have riffraff. We all have things that we have with us that came with us as tagalongs. We need to be vigilant and sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that we will not be betrayed by tagalongs that we neglected to leave in Egypt. There are some things that we still want to have and have not totally let go of. Amen? That sometimes dictate how we respond and how we act because we don't want to get rid of our riffraff. God saved me. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. He brought me out. Yet, there's some riffraff in my life sometimes that brings doubt. There's riffraff, and we'll talk about this later, that reminds me and tries to tell me I was better off before. Riffraff that will dictate what you, you think or how you respond. It's like that fifth wheel. You've got to cater to it because you never let it go. And it has no state. It has no commitment to your God. It's not going to lose anything. Because it's not the one that was saved. It's not the one that's been cleansed. It's not the one that's going to go to heaven or hell. Riffraff. Things that weigh us down. Things that hinder us. Things that do not allow us to do what we know we need to do. Because we... We felt at the moment. See, some of this riffraff didn't just, uh, they weren't stowaways. 
They didn't hide in somebody's luggage or in somebody's trunk. <laughs> Some of these were invited. Hey, we're, 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 we're going out of town. <laughs> we got a plan. We're going to be... Y'all want to come? You're not having Egypt? Y'all want to come? Oh, yeah, we'll come with you. No promise. The promise wasn't theirs. But they were looking for a, for a way out. I have to be very careful. <laughs> there are times in our spiritual walk that we will walk in the wilderness, and at times it may feel redundant, but, there, but we are a people of promise. And if we must be in the wilderness for a time, we cannot allow mixed multitudes of riffraff or rabble to influence our walk with God. There are going to be difficult times. There are going to be times that it seems like, here we go again, it's the same Oh, thing, but we need to keep in mind that we are going to the promised land. There is a reason we walk this way. There is a reason we talk this way. There is a reason we dress this way. There's a reason we praise this way because we are in a journey. And sometimes it is through a wilderness and through a hard time or through a, a very difficult time. We cannot listen to the voices in our mind, in the back of our mind that tells us you were better off in Egypt. You are better off if you just turn around and go back where you came from because it's not as redundant. It's not as boring. It's awesome back there. There are times that you're going to go in our walk with God that we're going to have difficult times and you're going to wonder, okay, Lord, this isn't part of the study, but Moses got so frustrated with them. That he wanted to quit. If you read on in Numbers, he wanted to just, Lord, forget it. Why'd you bring me out with these people? But you see, it wasn't the people. It was the riffraff that was hindering the people. It, it was those that weren't committed, those that, that just wanted to be along for the ride. Now listen to me, because there is riffraff, and we need to pray that, Lord, don't let me be the riffraff. Don't let me be the one that's talking negative to my brother and my sister. Don't let me be the one that's complaining about the church service being too quiet or too loud. Or, or I don't like that one preacher, but I like the other one. Don't let me be that riffraff that hinders the progression of the kingdom of God. Because we are going somewhere. We are advancing in the kingdom of God. We are moving forward. The church is not going to die. The church is not going to... Turn back around. Don't be the reason that somebody's second-guessing themselves. Riffraff. So I got to be careful. <laughs> Don't be riffraff. Lord, help me. We must remain faithful and cannot take hold of this plow and look back. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, he said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit to the, for the kingdom of God. Riff raff. Why are you looking back to Egypt? Riff raff will lie to you. Riff Raff will tell you it's better off, you're better off somewhere else. Look at what we ate in Egypt. You know what? what, what you <clears throat> you, you, you know why I can't lose weight? Because I like to eat. <laughs> and I live for the moment. Sometimes I can't help myself. I just got to go back for more. I know I shouldn't. But you know what? It satisfies me right now. And that's what's wrong with riffraff. God was giving them manna, and manna was sufficient. That was bread from heaven. Okay, here we go. You come in here and you hear the word of God that is preached from the word, from the Bible. That's truth. 
You hear about tithe, whether you like it or not. It's from the Word of God. And we heard it for over a month. Now, this has nothing to do. Tony, did a, Brother Ritter, did a tremendous job. I've heard so many compliments of, I've never heard it that way. I've never seen it that way. Oh, it was so clear and it was so simple. Easy to understand because it came directly from the word manna. But you know what we want? We want the, the feel-good message that you're going to be all right. Just live like you want, do what you want, and everybody's going to make it to heaven. Riff raff. Give me that kind of message. Give me a message that I can believe any way I want and just feel good in my heart and ask Jesus to come into my heart and I'm going to be okay. Riff raff. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting... Never mind. We can't look back. We can't allow situations and circumstances. See, that's why we need to have a, a relationship with God, and that's why we need to get rid of the riffraff that we may have. If there is something hindering you in your walk with God, you must get rid of that because that will dictate, and it will hinder you, and it will bother you, and it will always try to pull you backwards. It will always want to take you back where you came from. It will always say it was better there, but it won't remind you of your torment. It won't remind you of your depression. It won't remind you of the bondage. It won't remind you of the things that you suffered with. Amen. It just reminds you of the food that was well, good. It was good food. Jesus also in Luke seventeen thirty two reminds us of Lot's wife. Remember. Lot's wife. We, I think we all know the story that he was taking them from Sodom, the angel of the Lord. He was going to take them to a mountain. And Lot said, no, let's just go to this little city over here. Oh, my goodness. And the angel said, okay, we'll take you there. Just don't look back. Just don't look back. And as they were going, I don't know what riffraff, what thing she forgot. Or what was so important to her that she looked back. And the Bible says immediately she turned into a pillar of salt. There, there, there is danger in looking back. There, there, there's danger in wanting to go back. Because God's kingdom is not going backwards. Okay, this is in my notes, but it's been something I've been thinking about because I heard it ministered, and I was like, well. But when Jesus rose again, and he was about to ascend to, to, to heaven, and the, the, the disciples were and said, Lord, well, at this time, well, at this time, will you restore the kingdom of David. In other words, they were saying, at this time, can we go back to how it used to be? Right now, I know it's a prophetic word. I know that in time, in the future, that Jesus is going to reign and all, all that. But they were asking, are you going to restore? Are you, gonna, are you, Jesus, going to go sit in the throne and get us out of this rule of, of, of the Romans? Will you restore that kingdom right now? Jesus said, oh, no, it's not it's not for you to know the time or the hour. It's not time for you to know. You go up. I got something greater for you. Something that's, oh, I'm not going to sit in a throne in Jerusalem. I'm going to sit in the throne of your heart. I'm not going to restore an earthly kingdom. I'm going to get a kingdom of God. And, and the throne that I'm going to sit in is within you. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. You know, that's why I must go and come again. I'm going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. You know, we always want to restore. Oh, can we go back to how it used to be? Well, I, I don't want to go back to how it used to be. Some people say, oh, those were the good old days. Yeah, but I want to go forward to the great new days and the great new things that God is going to do in this kingdom. I'm excited about 
about the revival that is happening in the church of Columbus. I am happy about the revival that's going to take place in the end time because I want to be a part of this, but I cannot allow the riffraff to continue to pull me back to, well, it used to be this way, or it was that way, or you're better off that way. No, I want to go to what God has in store. I want to move forward in my relationship with the Lord. Can't let riffraff distract us and hinder us and pull us back and pull us aside. Don't, don't be riffraff. Mm. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are a new creation we're not what we used to be. We've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He washed us, cleansed us, and filled us with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Also, in the conversion of a sinner, when a person repents, is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost, there is a change so deep, so clear, so entire, and so abiding that it is proper to say that he is a new creation of God. A work of divine power has decided and as glorious as when God created things out of nothing. You understand? It is a new creature, a, a new cre creation. There is no other moral change that takes place on earth so deep and radical and as thorough as a change at salvation. There is nothing that compares it and it is attributed to the mighty power of God. Hallelujah. There is no change. When you come to God, you are a new creature. A writer wrote it this way. He said, the man is not only mended, but he is made new. He is a new creature, a new creation, a little world of himself formerly. All that was in chaotic disorder. Now there is a new creation which God himself owns as his workmanship, which he can look on and pronounce very good. You are a new creature. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word renovation or renewing means to renovate. That means to take down some things and put up new things. Amen. That is to take up old carpet and lay a new floor. That means taking down old pictures and putting up new pictures. That means getting rid of some riffraff and putting up something new. Because that's what it is about being a new creature. We are saved. God brings us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And I, Peter writes it so nicely in 1 Peter 2.9. and said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, in which time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. But sometimes, all the time, Egypt wants to hang on. The riffraff begins to murmur and complain. We got to get rid of riffraff. <laughs> We, we've got to get rid of it. You, we've got to examine our lives. We've got to examine our hearts and look deep inside ourselves. You know, we're going somewhere. The Church of Columbus is going forward. Amen. I am so excited about what the Lord is doing, the baptisms, the, the testimonies. What a tremendous Easter service we had. The balcony. Oh, so if anybody tells me, Brother Wilson, they want to go back to 2019, you know, like 2020 never happened, I won't go back to 2019. 
I always don't want to go back to 2020. Oh, but I am so excited about what the Lord is doing in 2021 and what he's going to continue doing. Oh, I don't want to go back how it used to be. I want to step into something new. I want to hear something new every time I come to church. I want to experience a new experience with God every time I come to church. I, want to, I, don't, want to go, I don't want to sit in the pew and say, oh, here we go, singing the same old song again. You know what? It's the same old God. I don't mean to call you old God. You're not the same old God. But you know what I'm trying to say? Because it's not the song. It's how we respond to the song. It's not who's singing the song. It's how we choose to react and respond and how we, we come prepared. If, if something new isn't happening in church with you, check to see if there's riffraff hanging around. See, see, see if there's a tag along there. There's a fifth wheel that's dictating how you respond when you are with the one you love. Yes. Something that's interfering, Brother Wilson, that I've got to take care of. I can't pay attention to my date because he's back, <laughs> he's back there telling a story because he ain't got nobody else to talk to. You understand what I'm saying? Fifth wheel. Riffraff. And sometimes... That dictates our walk with God, and we need to get rid of We need to pull the car over, tell them, look, get out. I'll buy you a taxi. Go on. Let me enjoy my time with God. Let me enjoy my time with the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? We need to get rid of that. If there's somebody that is hindering your worship, you need to pray for them. You need to, you, you need to talk to them about the word of God. But my God, if they are hindering your walk with God, at some point you've got to let it go and say, I, I, look, I don't want to hear the gossip. I don't want to hear what's going on in their life. If you're not praying for them, if you're not, I don't want to hear it. I just want to be what God wants me to be. There, Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. Let me see where we go. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing that we are also compassed about with so great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so does easily beset us. That word is to thwart, thwart, I can't even say that word, a runner. Let me see. I gotta feel comfortable. Justin. <laughs> Initiation. <laughs> no, because just don't, slightly, I just want you to slightly jog like from this over here to those over there. Just slightly jog, see? Because beset does this to you. <laughs> This is what, that's what be said. That's what the sins do to you. It's not going to let you. You hear me? It's not going to, this way, bro. You forgot? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because see, that's, that's what the, that, that's what riffraff does to you. I, I'm trying to get there with God. God called me there. But this is, this is a sin. And this is the way that does so easily beset you. Let you get a little close. And then it says, oh, no, remember where you came from. We've got to get rid of the thing that's pushing us around. We need to get rid of the thing that won't let us be the Sunday school teacher. We need to get rid of the thing that will not allow us to go to the altar. We need to get rid of the thing that won't allow us to, thank you, that will not allow us to answer the call that God's placed in our heart that we know we ought to be doing. We've got to get rid of the riffraff. But I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. God brought me out with a mighty hand. Oh, yes, he did. But there are some things that we brought along that we should have left in Egypt. And now we're having to deal with them. That it is time as a church that we get rid of them. So that we can be what God has called us to be. There are some of us that are sitting in the pew that ought to be singing in the choir. There are some of us that are here in church that ought to be teaching the Sunday school class. There are somebody that is sitting in the house of God that you know you're called to teach Bible studies. And you ought to be teaching Bible studies. But there's hindrances. There's riffraff. The word says that we need to lay aside every weight and sin that easily thwarts us. Why does it do it so easily? Because we invited him. 
It's ours. We let it reside there. We let it, we keep it there. That's why it's, it so easily pushes it aside. That's why it's so easy to sleep through your prayer time. Riff raff. Sins that so easily beset us, weights that hinder us. We must find a place to repent for allowing riffraff to dictate our walk, to manipulate our praise, to control our worship, and to try to get us to go back to Egypt. I want to tell you tonight, it is not better in Egypt. It is not better where you came from. In Egypt, we paid the price. In God's kingdom, he paid the price. You know, the fish weren't free. And it's probably later on in my notes, and I might repeat it again, but I gotta say it right now. When the riff rises, we ate freely. In Egypt, who ate the fish? That oh, that wasn't free. There was a price that was paid that they did not like very well, or else they wouldn't be in the wilderness. <coughs> and things would tell you you're better. No, you're not. You're not better in Egypt. My friends were more committed to me back then. Oh, really? God is doing great things do not allow the riffraff to keep you from being a part of what God's doing in this church we cannot move forward if we keep looking back we need to understand that the riffraff acted according to their nature Because for the riffraff, there was no covenant, no promise, no promise line, no assurance. The riffraff has nothing to lose because they are a lost cause. The mixed multitude may have been dangerous most of all in this, that it did not mean to be dangerous at all. After all, they were invited. They didn't believe that they were a danger. And that's the dangerous part. We need to be careful who we invite into our intimate circle. (coughs) Relationship can compromise you. They mean no harm, probably do not know any better, but you know it hinders you. It has you looking back instead of looking forward and you need to be careful oh lord help us because some of us are thinking about riffraff right now Uh, let me see how did I miss that part for we wrestle not Some of us are thinking, well, sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so, that's roof forever right there. <laughs> Before you start looking and pointing fingers and stuff. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There are spirits that would hinder us. That's why so often sometimes, so often sometimes, does that even make sense? So often sometimes... <laughs> So often, sometimes, I ask us to pray for one another. And sometimes, you ought to go pray for somebody you don't want to go pray for. Because that person isn't the riffraff. It's that spirit that's hindering it that's the riffraff. And that's what's got to go. And the only way to get rid of that riffraff is to break through in the power of the almighty God. You know, the mighty God that brought you out of Egypt would deliver you and help you throughout that situation so you can get rid of the riffraff. 
Does this make sense? Good, because when I started writing this list, I had no idea what I was going to teach tonight. I'm not going to say I had no idea. I knew, I thought I knew. Oh, where was I? 2 Timothy 2.22 says this. And we always talk to young people about this. But this is for just us <laughs> that are old. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I call myself up. Flee also youthful lust. Sometimes we stop there, right? But follow. Pursue. Well, how? This is what you, you, you you flee those things that want to take you back, but then you follow. Well, what do I follow? Where do I go? Where do I look? What gets me from there to there? You follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But you cannot follow those things if you're constantly looking back. That word follow in the Greek means to pursue. Chase righteousness. What else can I do? Chase faith. Try your faith. Chase it. Pursue it. Charity, there is agape. Agape love. You love like God loves. Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 14 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. Egypt is temporal. You see, because you can see Egypt. You can't see the kingdom yet. That's eternal. Okay, y'all got that? Don't be looking back. Be looking. That's why faith is one of those things. Why is, it, why, why is faith one of those things? I go after I keep, something after I can't see. Let's all stand together. Mr. Richards taught on this the other day. Philip, Philip, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to challenge you today to get rid of the riffraff. Not your brother, your sister I'm talking about, but the spirits that would hinder those relationships. The things in your life that hinder your walk with God. Pastor Shepard uses the, the illustration of that old muddy boot that the, you know, the enemy would draw and just let it drip at the tip of your nose. You know, but sometimes it's not that muddy boot. It's the thing you have in your pocket yes. that you need to get rid of. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Is that thing that you brought with you to the altar, not the thing that the enemy's fishing out, that you've got to repent of and give it to God and say, God, this has kept me from going 100%. This is the thing that hinders me, and I need to give it back to you. I need to get rid of it. It's riffraff in my life. Brought me out with a mighty hand, and I held on to some riffraff. And it's time that if we want to progress and we want to grow in our kingdom and in our relationship with God, that you recognize what that riffraff is and let it go. Let it go back to Egypt. Let it go back where it wants to go as you walk forward in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you help us, God, in our pursuit, dear God, of you. That you help us look at ourselves and acknowledge, dear Lord, our life and our heart and our mind. Help us, Lord, to get rid, dear Lord, of hindrances, those things, dear God, that come up against us. Help us be positive. Help us, Lord, have an attitude of gratitude, dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord, forgive us, oh God, for carrying things that would hinder our walk with you. Things that would want to turn us back, dear God, to Egypt. Dear Lord, take them from us, dear Lord, as we commit ourselves to you. Help us grow, dear Lord, in you each and every day. Help this church, dear God, as we progress and as we grow and we move forward. Help us all to be a part of what is going good in the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for you, our mighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.